So whilst we're just bringing up the slides, uh, for those of you that aren't aware, EADS is one of the biggest aerospace and defence companies in Europe. We own Airbus, Astrium, Eurocopter, Cassidian, um, and many other subsidiaries of those companies. Now my role is, can you, well, can you, uh, thanks. My role within that is part of the company called EADS Innovation Works. So we are the corporate research division for the entire EADS group. And within that, I'm the research team lead for the cyber operations team. So that means it's quite an exciting role because one minute I could be pen testing the new Airbus A350 and the next minute we could be doing the military networks with Cassidian. Um, the team is transnational and global, but the work in the UK specifically revolves around critical infrastructure protection. Now, we have a SCADA test bed in Newport, so we do a lot of this work in-house and we do a lot of our own proprietary developments in this world. CNI is one of the big topics of interest at the moment and I always find it very interesting when I go to other people's talks in CNI to see what everybody else classifies as CNI and it's growing very very big at the moment um, but for us um, and the objective for this talk is to give you an understanding of what we mean by CNI what we are currently doing in the space and perhaps explain to you a little bit about some of the problems of doing security in an environment where corporate IT security just doesn't apply. Even some of the basic principles are not possible at the moment. So for us, CNI is oil, gas, utilities. Anything that we need in day-to-day -day life to make the country run. The important thing to take away from this is CNI doesn't just have an effect on the businesses and on finance. The impact of an attack against CNI is environmental, it's human, potentially cost of loss of life, as well as financial. Um, I put here secondary CNI. So there are seven defined CNIs by CPNI themselves in the US, and they constitute utility transport communities. All those things you see there. But actually, and these are the ones that are starting to come in a little bit more. Um, things that make the country run, finance, agriculture, they all rely on embedded systems to make things happen for the production lines, for uh, the trading floors in financial, for example, they're embedded systems. And that for us is the core of what CNI is, they're SCADA based systems, supervisory control and data acquisition. And I'll come on to that in a little bit in a minute. Um, don't forget they're also used in the military. Unfortunately I can't talk any more about that, but these systems are still there. There's a camera over there. Um, in the UK at least, these are mainly reliant on the private sector. And most of these systems have been in place since about 1970 and probably haven't changed since then. So that's the first challenge we're dealing with, is they're mainly legacy systems. SCADA itself is, and I won't go into this in too much detail, but just give me a rough idea by show of hands, how many people have come across SCADA systems before? Always good to see a few hands in the air, right? SCADA systems, in principle, are sensors and actuators. They're little boxes that sit there and process voltage values. The things they are attached to, however, are usually much larger. They're big motor trains, processing mills, power plants. Um, but ultimately, you have fairly standardized type of devices. Programmable logical controllers. Um, I haven't got one around, but there's some in Will's office. And remote terminal units are the two main methods that are used for programming. They're logic-based devices. They read inputs based on the input. They have a logical stream, usually in ladder logic or some other programming language that's very basic, and then process the output to turn on or off particular motors and valves. However, we also consider other parts of the system. HMIs, historians, the architecture consists of potentially Windows-based systems as well the things that the operator can see and utilize to actually engage with the environment. So for us, this is still part of security of critical infrastructure as well. To give you an idea of the makeup of a critical infrastructure, or a SCADA system if you like, this is a slightly old diagram now, um, but it will give you the basic idea. And you can see the take home points from this are they're distributed. So I don't necessarily have one site. We do a lot of work in Cassidian in the Middle East, for example, with the oil and gas refineries and processing plants out there. When we're talking about the scale of some of these systems, don't forget that some of those facilities in the Middle East are and have the footprint of the size of the UK. 
I have to fly from one end to the other. That makes incident response very interesting. Um, and you, somebody was talking earlier about hopping between the network and following things around. Try doing that on an aeroplane. Um, the other thing, of course, is we have wireless communication mechanisms. We have multiple entry points within these networks. So we have to defend at every single one of these points. Um, on the network itself, we have many old operator networks, some of which might even be Windows NT, Windows 95, completely unpatched, as you'd fully expect from a system that hasn't changed since 1970. So that's something else we're dealing with. So how did we get where we are today? Why is SCADA now such a big topic? Somebody usually shouts stucks now at that point. But we'll come to that in a minute. So the development of these systems has been fairly rapid over the last 15, 20 years. It's been economic drivers. It's been um, efficiency savings by the plants themselves who want to be able to get information direct from the processing plant up to managers who like Excel and spreadsheets and graphs. Because they can make decisions and save money and make more profit. But in technical terms, the first systems were very monolithic. Um, they couldn't really talk from one end of the plant to the other, and they certainly couldn't talk long range over many miles and kilometers. In those days, they were proprietary protocols. Um, so the manufacturers themselves had many different protocols that were completely unworkable for any other parts of the system. Um, and they were pretty much closed systems. But in order to facilitate that economic growth of the systems, they started to network them together. For efficiency, if one part of your plant goes wrong, you want to slow down the other part of your plant. So you start networking them together so the systems can talk to each other. Um, still, they had proprietary protocols. There's things like Profibus coming in there now, so we can talk across serial links, for example. Um, but they were still predominantly closed systems. Uh, they rely very heavily on physical security. So these have gates, guards, in the Middle East guns, which always makes physical pen testing very interesting. Um, and they, that's still the approach they take today. However, uh, again, mainly through economy, uh, open source protocols, uh, TCP, IP, normal networking stacks, they're very cheap, they're very open, they're very standardized. And these people aren't stupid, so when you produce your device, you want to produce it as cheaply as possible. So they start putting TCP, IP, open protocols, and multiple communication mechanisms in there. In terms of system level, it also means you can do a lot more with the HMIs, because you can transform more data at rapid rates. So essentially we've moved within 20 years from monolithic systems, mainframes as well potentially, some of you may have worked with those before, through to a fairly big distributed network. And this is what a modern SCADA system looks like. Many devices you'd see, firewalls in there, Wi-Fi in there, um, plenty of servers up here mainly running SQL, unpatched. Um, but actually what we're seeing is the corporate network is now connected directly to the control network. When we've been actually pen testing some of these systems, they will insist they're air-gapped. Uh, usually the one, one I always use as an example is the first thing they said to me is we don't have a wireless access point. It took me a minute to find it. It took me five minutes to hack it. Um, they then said, don't worry, you can't get from the business network to the control system network. Unfortunately, I know where to look for these things, and it's usually somewhere in a Siemens software that provides a bridge for you between the network that they don't know exists. Uh, so it took me about another 10 minutes to get on the control network. At that point, they told me to stop. But we started to see some attacks against these systems. So this is the other thing. It's become more public. And I'm going to talk about three specific ones. I could give you many examples, but we'd be here all day. The three I'm going to talk about very quickly give you an overview of some of the problems of defending these systems. So the first one is uh, actually Marucci. Um, this was a water facility in Australia. The guys that built it was a consultant. Um, this is something else we must consider, is when we build these systems, we maintain these systems, we bring in consultants and integrators. So the people that run these systems and manage them aren't the ones that build them. So we must make sure that the assets are well defined in their configurations, which inevitably they're not, and we bolt things on here, there, and everywhere. So actually we don't understand by the time we come to secure the systems what it's actually doing. This particular example is a brand new facility. It's just opened. So the integrators built this from scratch. Being a typical engineer, being a typical consultant, um, after his job was finished, he wanted the contract for the maintenance. And he didn't get it. So what he did um, was realize that bad management, and this is simple management, this isn't anything novel, new, 
meant the Wi-Fi password hasn't been changed since he installed the system. Um, his account hadn't been locked out and the communications channels from the Wi-Fi to the SCADA network weren't secured properly. So he sat in the car park opening and closing valves to make little things go wrong so he'd have to be called out to fix it. Teething problems, I think they called it. Until over a, about a million litres of untreated sewage flooded into parklands, rivers and suddenly realised they had a problem. Two things are clear from this. One, the guy was only caught because he was still sat in the car park. And two, they only realised something was actually going wrong because another engineer was sat looking directly at the valve that he was opening and closing whilst he was doing it. We cannot put monitoring into these networks because they are safety critical. So we don't have IDS, we don't have IPS, we don't have firewalls. Anything that slows the system down, they're not looking for. Essentially the thing I keep getting told is that's a stop button. When I press that stop button, the system must stop. I don't want it being analysed, I don't want the packets being fudged out by a firewall that says, mm, not sure about that. This nuclear power plant must stop. Slammer. Very quickly about Slammer. Um, this actually hit a nuclear power plant in 2003. Not targeted malware at all. Um, a power plant was shut down and a contractor came in and connected his laptop up and unfortunately had Slammer. I mentioned earlier that we have historians, databases, all kind of things that are SQL, which are completely unpatched, make really good ground for Slammer to spread. And that's exactly what happened. This particular occasion, the nuclear power plant actually suffered some of its uh, mainly HMI machines, but other critical systems were damaged by the Slammer infection. They had to shut it down for three days to recover. It was already shut down, it just delayed them. But had this been active at the time, they'd have had a big problem. The story I always tell is I've actually got a copy of Slammer in my lab that I run as a testing environment. Um, it was so effective when I first ran it, I ground my network to a halt within a minute. Unfortunately, I also had one of my based demonstrators on the network that I'd forgotten about and managed to flood the lab. The biggie, the game changer. This is why we're all talking about SCADA today. Stuxnet. It was the first piece of malware specifically designed for PLCs, it had a root kit for PLCs. These things aren't difficult to hack, they're not difficult to make fall over, I can do it from an iPhone. But the complexity of this type of system, uh, this type of malware, is better than I've seen from any other malware around. I have to take my hat off to whoever wrote it. <coughs> Probably a nation state somewhere. So, what it did, essentially, was find a specific configuration of a specific system working in a specific way. Stuxnet was the delivery mechanism, by the way. There was plenty of other payloads that it used afterwards to get into the network. So Stuxnet is generally used as an umbrella term for about four or five different pieces of malware. And it hit uh, the Nate's uranium facility um, and basically started playing with values, valves, um, centrifuge timers, mainly to turn them on and off. And these systems don't respond very well to being turned on and off in a split second, so they eventually burn out. And that's exactly what this did. So why? Well, all of your usual cyber security or information security problems are still left. Denial of service, operator spoofing, eavesdropping. However, I'm seeing here the threat sources. So there's a lot more people targeting these with real advanced malware. AETs, APTs. I should say Stuxnet, by the way. Um, was only found out by Kaspersky Labs because somebody updated it. They had so much control over the plant that they actually managed to run an update on the virus. The update, typical programmers, cocked it up. And it got back out from where it should be. It tried to spread again. And Kaspersky found it and thought, this is a little bit unusual. Had that not update not happened, I would predict we still wouldn't know about Stuxnet today. Put that into context for what else is going on in the world. Who knows how many pieces of these type of malware are out there. So we're talking very much about these threat, thos threat sources. Um, the threats themselves are fairly traditional, except perhaps war dialing, which I haven't seen anywhere else since about 1979, 1980s. Um, but it's still existent here. Um, there are modems and various bits and pieces in SCADA networks that will answer very nicely and put you directly in touch with the control systems. Never mind. So, the weak protocols the proprietary protocols are still weak. They don't allow security. They are designed as safety critical. If it affects time, I don't want to know about it. It's got to re relay this message. Systems can't be patched at all. 
because it means shutdown. These systems are 24 7. And some of these systems haven't been shut down since about 1970, 1972. I think I was talking to somebody uh, in a production plant who said it hadn't stopped in, in over 60 years. So imagine that versus Microsoft Windows that resets itself every 10 minutes. Um, the systems aren't segregated specifically, um, actually on the control layer now, I'm not talking about between the various layers of networks. Antivirus, this is a contentious issue. Antivirus is not used on control networks at the moment. Mainly because, and I know this from my own personal experience, antivirus is really annoying. It slows your system down, it restarts it, generally when it crashes it brings everything down with it, and that's not good inside a critical infrastructure. So we need other ways of dealing with these problems and doing these things specifically for CNI. Um, logging is difficult, but we do now log things like sensor information and those kind of things coming off the plant. What we need for that, and what I mean by this, is we now need to start logging cyber information as well, security information, security metrics. Please. And this is a very quick slide on how I manage to attack a system normally. Um, it's the usual type of injection, SQL predominantly, hop across a firewall or two, and you're into a control system. And then you can pretty much do what you want. This is the take home slide. Um, this is really what we're dealing with, and these are the differences between corporate IT security and SCADA systems. At the moment, there is a tendency to bolt corporate IT onto SCADA systems, and you will do more damage than good. You will break the systems. Um, Failing to understand this has cost many a cybersecurity dear at conferences. The example I give for this was in the US not so long ago, and somebody was talking about good password management. It makes perfect sense in an IT domain. Have password length of a certain amount, characters, must change, must do everything. And about 20 minutes into his, his talk, somebody at the back stood up, identified herself as the lead for US regulation for the energy sector. And she said, if you do that, your lights will go out. The PLC will just fail. It won't cope with it. It's too small. It's not intelligent enough. They will just fail and fall over. Um, talking of password management, by the way, slightly detouring, um, some of these PLCs are very kind that they have a either hardware-coded root password, which is brilliant, or if they do let you change it and you send an SNMP trap to it, they'll send the password back to you in plain text. Really nice. So the systems themselves can't cope with these type of devices anyway. However, remember these. System life expectancy. This is always a good question when I ask audiences. I say, how many of you have got a laptop that's three years or less? And virtually everybody always puts their hand up. These systems are designed to run constantly for up to 25 years or more. Some of them, as I said, have been there for nearly 60 years and have never stopped. So technology has moved so far ahead of some of these systems that we are a long way behind. And actually, bolt-on might be the only option we've got at the moment. The next development cycle, for Marucci or somewhere in of, of a new system, a new plant, the next scheduled update might be 25 years down the line. So people just keep adding bits. Antivirus we've already discussed. Patching um, actually has to be done by vendors usually. So the vendors themselves, the integrators have to come out, have to do the patching themselves. It's not something people in the plants can do and understand. And the other thing of course is we better make sure the patch is secure because that could be interesting. System changes don't happen very often in SCADA systems. They happen all the time, and I feel sorry for you in the in university world. But even in commercial terms, system changes happen all the time. There's something being plugged in, taken home. And that's not necessarily the case in SCADA systems, but we stu do still see additional devices coming in from contractors, consultants, etc. Time critical. They are absolutely time critical. Delays anywhere in the network are not acceptable. Um, and they are safety dependent. So that's mainly why some of these things at the moment are designed the way they are. Availability and downtime is not going to happen. Um, some of our consultant, uh, some of our contracts in the Middle East, for example, if we take down their power plant uh, or their oil refinery, they could be losing somewhere in the estimation of about two and a half million dollars an hour. Downtime is not an option. Communication protocols are well known, well understood in corporate IT. Um, proprietary, generally still, we've got things like Profinet, um, 
DMP3, DMP3 Secure starting to make their way into SCADA systems. Um, they are starting to change, they are starting to converge, but at the moment some of the underlying communications are still proprietary. That makes things like network monitoring a little bit more difficult. Um, and the security priorities. So authentication, argue this if you like, especially those of you with an IT background in cybersecurity for corporate worlds. Authentication and confidentiality generally are the things you pin yourself on. Um, availability is still there, but if you lose email for an hour or so, it, okay, it annoys people. So these are the things we spend all, most of our money doing. SCADA systems, it's completely the opposite. Availability and integrity come first. Although confidentiality is starting to pick up as people realize the only place they have their IPR in one place is on their production system. Talk to pharmaceutical companies about that. So those are the differences. In the real world, security by obscurity is still too common a misconception. They still think because they're sat behind guarded walls, they're OK until you point out that network cable that runs right past them out the front door. Control systems are air-gapped from commercial networks. Yes, they are, but they're not sufficiently air-gapped. USB sticks or transfer of data is pretty much always the way these type of things get in. Somebody plugs a laptop in, goes straight around the air-gap. Um, wireless technologies and radio technologies, it probably should say they're over wireless networks, but they are used, potentially they are vulnerable. SCADA components themselves are still very vulnerable. Um, for those of you that ever want to venture into testing in these environments, please don't run a port scan. They will fall over, they will stop responding once you get past about port 193-ish. Um, it learned a very valuable lesson the first time we did that. Um, so actually some of these systems themselves, we have to test them very carefully and we have to understand the domain we're working in. It is very different. Auditing is still poor, but we are getting better. Uh, cyber attack impacts are not fully understood at the moment. Stuxnet was slightly different, but actually how we do that, we need to fully investigate. Um, I'm going to skip the last couple of slides, so I'll leave you with the positives. It's always a good place to leave you. Um, the first thing is the manufacturers, the plants, the operators are aware of this problem now. It's been something that perhaps over the last few years they've sort of not invested as heavily as they should have done in. They now are. Um, so that is the first thing, is they're aware of trying to secure these systems. The second positive is there's a lot of doomsday scenarios out there at the moment. Don't forget these systems work on the first principle of fail-safes. So if there is a system that is critical, it will always have at least one backup. And usually it's by a different manufacturer that makes the PLC. It's a different configuration, which makes things more difficult for the attacker. Um, so safety is still considered the number one in CNI. And it's also now a very active research area. So things are starting to, to develop in terms of uh, devices that are specific to the requirements and the statute of CNI. And that's probably a good point to end because I've run over by a couple of minutes.